Okay, let's begin. My name is Andreas Arnason. I'm a teacher here at BTH. I usually teach a uh, course that does revolve around uh, web programming. And one of the courses I have is about DevOps and continuous integration and deployment in cloud environments. So that's why I am here having a lecture today. So today we're going to talk about what is DevOps. I don't think you'll have a clear understanding after this. DevOps can be hard to grasp and it's not set in stone what it actually is. So it's a lot about making up your own mind what it's about and stuff like that. And today I will try to keep it quite, um, I will not talk about tools as much, but instead I will talk about what DevOps means for an entire workplace and a work culture because that's what a lot of what it's about. So many people think about DevOps as specific tools like Chef, Docker, Ansible, running, yes, running continuous integration, deployment, but the tools alone are not DevOps. What makes the tool DevOps is the manner of their use and not the tool themselves. DevOps is a way of thinking and a way of working. It's a framework for sharing stories and developing empathy, enabling people and teams to practice their craft in effective and lasting ways. So from the book, the DevOps handbook, which has here, and a lot of this lecture is based upon, we get the quote, DevOps is a manifestation of creating dynamic learning organizations that continually reinforce high trust cultural norms. Uh, or it can also be seen as applying the lean principles to the technology value stream. So I'm hoping and guessing that many of you in here at least have heard about lean and agile and know what it is, which is very popular right now in, or has been several years in development. And then we can see DevOps as the next step of the whole lean and agile movement. So what does that actually look like for a company that uses uh, DevOps? So uh, the common players in software development is product owners, architectures, development, quality assurance, IT operations, and information security. And I probably missed many more, but they are common names. We want them to work together, not only to help each other, but also to ensure the overall organization succeeds. By working towards a common goal, they enable the fast flow of planned work into production. In other words, performing tens, hundreds, or even thousand code deploys per day, while at the same time achieving stability, reliability, availability, and security in production. And with production environments, I'm not, I'm not only talking about uh, the environment that runs the customer code, but also their own environments in-house where they build and test environment, because that's an important part too. We have cross-functional teams that rigorously test their hypotheses of which features will most delight users and advance the organizational goals. They care not just about implementing user features, but also actively ensuring that their work flows smoothly and frequently through the entire value stream without causing chaos and disruption to IT operations or on any other internal or external customer. Quality assurance, IT operations and InfoSec are always working on ways to reduce friction for the team, creating the work systems that enable developers to be more productive and get better outcomes. By adding to the expertise of quality assurance, IT operations, and InfoSec uh, into the delivery teams and automate self-service tools and platforms, teams are able to use expertise in their work without being dependent on other teams. And this enables organizations to create a safe system of work where small teams are able to quickly and independently develop, test, and deploy code and value to maximize develop productivity, enabling organizations to learn creating a high employee satisfaction and at the same time win, market, win the marketplace. So we want developers with the help of the other teams be able to deploy, create code and test it and deploy it 
themselves. They're still quite up above, so let's take a look at uh, an example of a company called Etsy.com. So I'm guessing many of you have heard about Etsy at least. It's a very popular website that where people sell stuff basically. And they were very fast in the beginning on the adopting DevOps. And they're also one of the leading corporations in DevOps. They do a lot of open source stuff. They talk on conferences and stuff like that. So let's see how it looks when they hire new people. When DevOps, hello, Etsy hire a new engineer. On the first day, they get the laptop with a development virtual machine set up. The virtual machine is set up using configuration management as to be as similar to continuous integration and product, product environments and their other colleagues. So this should all be done automatically using code. The laptop is also already set up with appropriate accounts for access and authorization to the most common GitHub repos with them uh, cloned. Aliases and shortcuts uh, to relevant tools are pre-created. And they also have a guide for new hires with information to other resources. The current employee will also be paired with um, an old employee to help them walk through what testing and development look like for day-to-day -day work. At the same day, they also the new employee also start by writing code, which is uh, which is run on the local virtual machine. The virtual machine is also set up with uh, tests for unit tests and functional tests, so she can make sure uh, that her work is working and doesn't destroy anything for the other colleagues and the production environment. When the code is written, passes all the tests, she then moves it to something called try servers, which is a Jenkins cluster that's supposed to be nearly identical to the call it, uh, continuous integration and production environment. The try server is also um, does not have any connection to uh, Git or GitHub and stuff like that. So she doesn't need to introduce her code into any other people yet. When uh, the try servers are, has passed all their tests, then it's time to add code to Git or version control in some way. A common way to do is always to have uh, force people to do pull requests and ask for code review of your colleagues so they can make sure that your code works. However, however, at Etsy, that's not mandatory. It's up to the individual's own discretion to know if the changes she, she has made need a um, code review. Because Etsy has a high trust, blameless environment where people are given the trust and authority to decide whether code review is necessary. When she does her commit to uh, the version control, her code is added to something called the push queue. So everyone who wants to deploy something or add to Git, they add it into queue, so it's done one after the other. And when it's her turn in the queue, it activates something called the deployinator, which takes her changes and adds it to the quality assurance environment which uh, starts servers and runs the entire continuous integration test suite. And if everything passes there, she looks through the result of the quality assurance environment, so every, every pass test test. She looks through all the log files to make sure that she can't find any problems that the automatic tests missed. And if everything looks good, she then again activates the deployinator, which takes her code and add to production. And if something would break on production, they also have lots of dashboards and graph in different places. So it will be easy to see if something starts acting strangely. So they have a lot of telemetry in the environments and they have alerts set up if thresholds are met when they send emails everywhere. So this whole process from having developed code to production takes them about 10 minutes on average. And this was in 2015. 
and Etsy deployed around 60 times a day back then. I'm guessing they do a lot more now. Uh, and engineers do this on the first day, then guided by a team member. So they have a workplace where every person employed has the trust that they know what they're doing, they are employed to do something, then they should be able to do that. And if something goes wrong, we see it's a way of learning and not a way to punish people. So this is what it looks like to start working at Etsy. So let's get back to more what DevOps is or why DevOps is needed. Or some people say it, why DevOps perform better than many other ways of working. So according to the DevOps handbook, this is because corporations are not able to resolve a core chronic conflict within their technology organization. In most IT organizations, there is an inherent conflict between development and IT operations which create a downward spiral resulting in ever slow time to market for new products and features which reduce quality, increase outages, and an ever-increasing amount of technical debt. And this is caused by competing goals between development and IT operations. IT organizations are responsible for many things. Among them are the following goals. Respond to rapidly changing competitive landscape. Provide stable, reliable, and secure service for their customers. The developers will try to respond to the market and add as much new functionality as possible to production, while IT operations try to provide a stable and reliable and secure experience for the customers, which can make them negative to changes in production, because this affects their goal. So when things are configured this way, development and IT operations has opposed goals and incentives. According to Dr. M. Goldratt, this is the core chronic conflict when organizational measurements and incentives across different silos prevent the achievement of global organizational goals. And this conflict creates a downward spiral which prevents achievement of desired business goals both inside and outside the IT organization. The result of this spiral is poor software and service quality and bad customer outcomes as well as daily need for workarounds, firefight, whether it be in production, management, development, QA, IT operations or infosec. So let's look at the three acts. The first act begins in IT operations, where the goal is to keep applications and infrastructure running so they can deliver to the customer. Their problems are caused by complex, poorly documented, and fragile applications and infrastructure. This is the technical depth and daily workarounds that they live with every day, promising that we will fix the mess when we have a little more time, but that time never comes. And when these systems fail, they jeopardize the most important organizational promises, such as availability to customer, revenue goals, security of customer data, and so forth. This takes us to the second act. When someone has to compensate for the latest broken promise, it could be a product manager promising bigger, bolder features or a business executive setting an even larger revenue target, oblivious of what the technology can or cannot do, or what factors led to missing the earlier commitment, they commit the technology organization to deliver the new promise. As a result, the developers are tasked with another urgent project that requires solving new technical challenges and cutting corners, further adding to the technical debt, made with the promise that it will be fixed when we have more time. And this sets the stage for the third and final act. Everything becomes a little more difficult, bit by bit, everyone gets a little busier, works take a little more time, communication gets slower, work use get longer. Smaller actions cause bigger failures, system get less tolerant of making changes, work requires more communication, coordination and approvals, 
teams must wait longer for the pendant work to get done, the wheel begin grinding slower and require more effort to keep turning. As a result, product delivery cycles are slower, fewer projects are started, we can no longer keep up with the changing market landscape and we lose market place. Once again, we learn that when IT fails, entire organizations fail. So how do we break this with DevOps? Small teams of developers independently implement their features, validate their correctness in production-like environments, and have their code deployed to production quickly, safely, and securely. And code deployments are routine and predictable. They happen all throughout the work week on all business days without customers even noticing it has happened. We have fast feedback loops at every step of the process. Everyone can immediately see the effects of their actions. Using automated testing, uh, we can help developers discover quickly if mistakes are made. We have production telemetry in both our code and production environments to ensure that the problems are detected and corrected quickly. We have high profile products and feature releases are done with dark launch techniques long before the launch date so that the code is already put in production and invisible for everyone except a small uh, internal employees or cohort of real users. With every fix we make, we generate organizational learnings, enabling us to prevent the problem from occurring again and detect similar problems faster. Everyone is constantly learning, fostering a hypothesis driven culture where everything is measured and development is handled as experiments. Instead of a culture of fear, we have a high trust collaborative culture where people are rewarded for taking risks. Employees are able to fearlessly talk about problems as opposed to hiding them and we must see problems in order to solve them. Because everyone fully owns their quality of work, everyone builds automated testing into daily work and use peer review to gain confidence that problems are found long before customers can be impacted. When something do go wrong, we conduct blameless post-mortems, not to punish, but to understand and learn what caused the accident and how can we prevent it from happening again. So this is how DevOps see the problem in many IT organizations and how DevOps want to fix it. So before we continue a bit on about DevOps is and how we use it, let's talk about its history, where it comes from. DevOps is a result from a broad stroke of movement. Uh, this is called uh, the convergence of DevOps by someone called John Willis. There are decades of lessons learned from manufacturing, high reliability organizations, high trust management models, and others that have brought us DevOps today. So DevOps re rely a lot on knowledge from lean, theory of constraints, and the Toyota production systems and others. While the foundation of DevOps can be seen as being derived from lean, theory of constraint, and Toyota Kata movement, Many also see DevOps as the logical continuation of the Agile software journey that began in 2001. So Agile and Lean can a lot be seen about how we handle customer requests and how developers handle that. So we get the request from a customer, which is created into a um, requirement somehow, and then the requirement is uh, shipped to the developers who develop it. So a lot of that is uh, handled by the Agile movement. So then we can see DevOps as what is done when developers are, are done with the code and what is ha what happens to the code until it's in production. So we can say that Dev DevOps is both Agile and it's two different separate things. DevOps work best when we use it with Agile, we can say. So what is the Lean movement? Or from, Dev from the Lean movement, we got techniques such as value stream mapping, Kanban boards and lead time. Lean has its roots in the Toyota production systems from the 1980s. And Lean principles focus on how to create value for the customer by creating constancy of purpose embracing scientific thinking, creating flow and pull, assuring quality at the source and leading with humility and respect for every individual at the workplace. 
The Agile Manifesto was created in 2001. They wanted to create a lightweight set of values and principles against a heavyweight software development process such as waterfall development. One key principle was to deliver working software frequently from a couple of weeks to a couple of months with a preference to the shorter timescales. They also had a desire for small batch sizes, incremental releases instead of large waterfall, small self-motivated teams working in a high trust management model. Many of the key movements moments in DevOps history has historically occurred within the Agile community or at the Agile conference. Then we had a continuous delivery movement. So building, building upon the development disciplines of continuous build, test and grand integration, Jess Humble and David Farley extended the concept of continuous delivery. They defined the role of a deployment pipeline to ensure that code and infrastructure are always in deployable state and that all code that is checked in can be safely deployed into production. Uh, this movement was presented in 2006 at an Agile conference. In 2009, Mike Rofer wrote the Toyota Kata, Managing People for Improvement, Adaptiveness and Superior Results. This framed his 20-year journey to understand and codify the Toyota production system. He was one of the people who helped develop the Lean toolkit, but he was puzzled why none of the companies adopting these practices managed to replicate the level of performance he observed at the Toyota plants. He concluded that the Lean community missed the most important practice, the improvement kata. Every organization has work routines and improvement kata requires creating structures for daily ha habitual practice of improving work because daily practice is what improves outcomes. The constant cycle of establishing desired future states, setting weekly target outcomes and continual improvement of daily work is what guided the improvement at Toyota manufacturing plants. And these are some of the historical moments that DevOps drew upon before it was created. In 2008, at the Agile Conference in Toronto, Canada, a guy named Patrick Debois and Andrew Schaefer held a birds of a feather session on applying Agile principles to infrastructure as opposed to apply, applying it to code. And then in 2009, at the Velocity Conference, John Alspo and Paul Hammond gave a presentation, 10 deploys per day, Dev and Ops cooperating at Flickr where they described how they created shared goals between development and operations and used continuous integration practices to make deployment part of every daily work. As a result of this, Patrick Debois created the first DevOps days and the term DevOps was coined. So this is when people started using the word DevOps and it has evolved since then in 2009 to what it is today. So in the beginning, as we can see from um, the presentation, DevOps cooperating with Flickr, we can see how DevOps days, it's spelled with a big D and a big O. Nowadays, however, and many people try to spell DevOps with at least a small O, uh, sometimes big D or not. And this is because um, in the beginning, it was about development and IT operations, but now in all the years it has moved forward. Instead, it's about the entire organization. So now it's not just IT operations, we include quality insurance, InfoSec, we include business managers and all of that. So that's why we see a lot of spelling with small d and o nowadays. I got the question in chat. Please explain something more practical. Uh, I will not be doing that really. It gets a little more practical soon, but I will not talk about tools and stuff like that because I think you must have this part before you move on to using the tools. Otherwise you miss the whole point of what DevOps is.
one of the fundamental concepts in Lean was something called the value stream, which come from manufacturing. Uh, value stream is the sequence of activities an organization undertakes to deliver upon a customer request or the sequence of activities required to design, produce and deliver as a service to a customer, including the dual flows of information and material. So these concepts come from the from manufacturing and there the value stream is often easy to see and observe. It starts when a customer order is received and the raw materials are placed onto the plant floor. There's usually a relentless focus on creating a smooth and even flow of work using techniques such as small batch sizing, reducing work in progress, preventing rework and constantly optimizing for our system toward our global goal. So in the manufacturing part, we are using physical parts. So it's easy to see when we add something and when we change something and when it moves forward or when it stopped. However, in the technology value stream, we can use the same things to enable fast flow uh, in the technology process. And in DevOps, we define the technology value stream as the process required to convert business hypotheses into a technology enabled service that delivers value to the customers, also known as lead time. However, how things move in the technology value stream is not easy to see here. Uh, the input of the value stream is usually a business objective, concept ID or hypothesis. And this work starts when we accept the work into a development backlog, usually. From there, it will be transcribed, transformed into user stories or feature specification, which is then implemented into our code by the developers. The code is then checked into version control and each change is integrated and tested with the rest of the software system. Because value is only created when our service are running in production, we must ensure that we are not only delivering fast flow, but our deployments can also be performed without causing chaos and disruption. There are key three metrics in the technology value stream, lead time, process time, and percentage complete and accurate. Yeah, we will talk about lead time and process time. Lead time starts when a request is made and ends when it's fulfilled. The process time starts only when we begin to work on the customer request and omits the time the work is in queue waiting to be processed. So this is when ticket, a customer creates a ticket and then it's in the backlog before anyone works on it. Then we start work and then we start the process time and the next work is completed. In DevOps, however, we focus on deployment lead time. This is the time between an engineer checking a change into version control up to the change running effectively in production and creating value to the customer and generating feedback. It's focused on this part because the process are similar to lean manufacturing. It strives to be predictable, mechanistic with the goal of achieving work outputs with minimized variability. In other words, short and predictable lead times with near zero defects. We want to achieve deployment lead time measured in minutes instead of months. And this is done by continually checking small code changes into version control, performing automated tests and deploying into production. So the real lead time is when we get ticket when we get when our product owner get the request from a customer and then things are done to it and then the developers are working on it and DevOps start focusing on when the developers are done with the code and then how it makes its way into production and the agile and lean mythologies they start the work here from ticket creation and until work is started on basically. All DevOps principles and behaviors can be derived from something called the three ways. The first way 
is to enable fast left to right flow of work from development to operations to customer. And from now on, when I talk about operations, I'm not only talking about IT operations, we're also talking about you know, including quality assurance and InfoSec and database guys and all of that. Just clump that under the word operations. In order to maximize flow, we need to make work visible, reduce batch sizes and internals of work, building quality by preventing defects from being passed downstream and constantly optimizing goals. By speeding up flow through the technology value stream, we reduce the lead time required to fulfill internal or customer requests, especially the time required to deploy code into production environment. The resulting practice include continuous build, and build integration, test and deployment processes, creating environments on demand, limiting working process and building systems and organizations that are safe to change. By doing this, we increase the quality of work as well as throughput. The second way enables fast and constant flow of feedback from right to left at all stages of the value stream. It requires that we amplify feedback to prevent problems from happening again or enable faster detection and recovery. By doing this, we create quality at the source and generate or embed knowledge where it is needed. It allows us to create ever safer systems of work where problems are found and fixed before a catastrophic failure occurs. By seeing problems as they occur, and swarming them until effective countermeasures are in place, we continually shorten and amplify our feedback loops, a core tenant of virtually all modern process improvement methodologies. This maximizes the opportunity for our organization to learn and improve. The third and last way enables us to enables the creation of a generation generating high trust culture that supports a dynamic, disciplined, and scientific approach to experimentation and risk taking facilitating the creation of organizational learning both from our success and failures. Furthermore, by continually shortening and amplifying our feedback loops, we create ever safer systems of work and are better able to take risks and perform experimentations that help us learn faster. We also design our systems of work so that we can multiply the effects of new knowledge, transforming local discoveries into global improvements, regardless of where someone performed work. They do so with the cumulative and collective experience of everyone in the organization. So we should, we'll take a closer look at the three ways. And these three ways of DevOps comes from the DevOps handbook, which is made by some of the people that created the first uh, DevOps days and stuff like that. And DevOps has change a lot from other people so i can also recommend the book uh, effective devops this one instead talks about four pillars which make up devops so many people have different views and it's hard to find one definition of what actually is devops so in the first way we want to optimize for the global goal of delivering value to our customers quickly with fast and smooth flow from development to operations. The goal is to decrease the amount of time required for changes to be deployed into production and increase the reliability and quality of those services. And through this, we need to make our work visible. To have flow, we must first see it. In manufacturing, it's easy to see what is produced and when it's being transferred because it's physical parts that are moved and created. In the technology value stream, it's not that simple. It can be hard to see where work is impeded or when it's piling up. And to help with this, we need to visualize the work. A good tool for this is the Kanban board, where a task can be created and organized to create the flow from left to right. The Kanban board should represent the entire value stream and the task is not done when development is complete on a feature, but instead when that code is running in production. So we include the entire organization into our view of what is work and when it's done. It's not just development that should be done. We want reduced batch sizes. Large batch size result in high work in progress and long lead times. We must strive to continually shrink batch sizes. Which batch size we talk about commits, 
features or any work that's needed to be completed and sent to production. An example of, different, of using different sizes, small versus large, can be seen in the example of mailing 10 brochures. Each brochure requires four steps. Fold the paper, insert the paper into the envelope, seal the envelope and stamp the envelope. If you use large batch, we would need to finish each step for all the brochures in order. First fold all the papers, insert all the papers, seal all the envelopes, stamp all the envelopes. And if we say each operation takes 10 seconds for each envelope, then it will take us 310 seconds to finish all the brochures. Then imagine if during the sealing phase, phase three, we discovered that we made an error in the folding phase, phase one. We will first discover this after 200 seconds and we have to refold and reinsert all the papers in the batch again. If we instead use small batches, single piece flow, the first brochure would be done after 30 seconds and any possible error would be caught within those 40 seconds and we should only need to redo that one brochure. This gives us less work in progress, faster lead time, faster detection of errors and less work. For software, the easiest batch to see is code. Every time someone checks in code, they are batching up a certain amount of work. And the more traditional way of working is branch-based development. So we have all the code from multiple developers working for weeks or months is then batched up and integrated as one unit. Instead, we want to work towards single piece flow where each change by each developer is committed to version control, is integrated, tested, and deployed into production by themselves. So this way we can discover errors earlier down the deployment pipeline. In the technology value stream, where deployment time is measured in months, it's usually because there are hundreds of of operations required to move code from version control into production. To transport code includes tasks such as functional testing, integration testing, environment creations, and server administration. And each time work is passed from one team to another, it requires communication, scheduling, deconflicting, testing, and verifying. Each of those steps are a potential queue where work has to wait increasing the work in progress. Knowledge is often lost between handoffs and which can cause failures. To mitigate these types of problems, we want to reduce the number of handoffs, handoffs either by automation or, uh, or reorganizing teams so they can deliver value to the customers themselves instead of having constantly depend on others. To continually reduce lead times and increase throughput, we need to continually identify our systems, system constraints and improve its work capacity. In the book Beyond the Gold, Dr. Goldratt states, in any value stream, there is always a, a direction of flow and there is always one and only one constraint. Any improvement not made at that constraint is an illusion. So if we have a constraint and we improve work before the constraint, we just pile up work and create a bottleneck at the constraint. If we improve after the constraint, instead we get starred waiting for work from the bottleneck, but we don't get it. Instead, we must always find our one big constraint, work on that one, fix it. Then we can go back and find our new constraint and fix that one. So continually identify and fix constraints. Common constraints in uh, non-DevOps workplaces are uh, environment, environment creation. So deployment on demand can, cannot be achieved if we have to wait for weeks or months for production and test environment. And the solution to this is create environments that are non on demand and self-serviced. And for example, using virtualization. So this is where a big part of virtualization comes into uh, DevOps. And I also believe that virtualization is one of the big reasons why DevOps can work so well. 
Uh, so it would have been hard for DevOps to arrive earlier than these latest years because of how much virtualization has um, developed during uh, the last years and become cheaper and we have clouds. Everything can be done with the push of a button. So before we had all this easy virtualization and Docker, we had to actually have a physical server somewhere, had to log into them and restart them and uh, install new operation systems and stuff like that. But with the new, all the new virtualization technologies, things become so much easier to take down and set up and install and run things from far away. So virtualization is a big reason why DevOps work and why it's become so big. And why I think it will only get bigger the more uh, companies start to learn and use virtualization uh, for themselves, not only for uh, customers and production like systems. Another constraint is code deployment. We also want code deployment on demand, but this can't be achieved if deployment takes weeks or months. For example, if it takes uh, 1300 manual error prone steps involving 300 engineers to deploy code. The countermeasure to this is to automate the deployment so that they are self-serviced by any developer. And here we have a lot of uh, configuration management and continuous integration tools like um, Circle CI, Travis, and all that. Next constraint is uh, test, setup, and run. We can't achieve short code deploys if it takes uh, weeks to set up test environments and get the data sets and additional weeks to manually execute all regression tests. And here we need automated test setup and execution with the continuous integration parts again come in. And again, we talk about virtualization so we can easily in the cloud or somewhere create uh, set up a new computer or a new server and then move the code there and execute all the steps and then we can get the result feedback next one is architecture all of the above is hard to achieve if the system is tightly architecture causing a code change needing to send engineers to committee meetings to get permissions for those changes it's better to have loosely coupled architecture where changes can be done with more autonomy. When all of these constraints have been broken, the constraints that are left are likely to be development or production owners. And because in DevOps, we want small teams of developers to independently develop, test and deploy quickly, reliably, this is where we want the constraint to be. This is the first way, basically. And here is where we use a lot of the cool tools and buzzwords. So here is where the techniques as continuous integration, deployment, configuration management, and all that is used. But this is only one out of two ways, so to say. So this is, should show that the DevOps is much more than just using tools. The second way is the principle that enables fast and constant feedback from right to left. The goal is safer and more resilient systems of work, which we achieve uh, with fast and frequent information flow throughout the value stream and organization. This includes feedback and forward loops. This should allow for detection and remediating problems while they are small, cheap and easy to fix. An important part of this is to create organizational learnings that is integrated into future work. When failures and accidents occur, they are treated as opportunities for learning instead of cause for punishment and blame. All of this is extra important when we work inside of complex systems. And in technology, most of our work happens in complex systems with a high risk of catastrophic consequences. We often discover problems only when a larger failure failures are underway, such as massive outages or a security breach. One of the defining characteristics of a complex system is that it defines any single person's ability to see 
the system as a whole and understand what, how all the pieces fit together. Because failure is inherent and inevitable in complex systems, we must design safe systems of work where work can be performed without fear, confidence, and that any errors will be detected quickly before they cause catastrophic outcomes. We can create uh, safer systems of work by meeting the four following conditions. Complex work is managed so that problems in design and operations are revealed. So we must see problems as they occur. Problems are swarm and solved, resulting in construction of new knowledge. New knowledge is exploited globally through the entire organization. And leaders create our leaders create other leaders who continually grow these types of capabilities. And um, third and fourth part of the, we'll talk about in the third way well we'll talk about the two ones now so see problems before they occur the goal is to increase information flow from as many areas as possible with as much clarity between cause and effect as possible in other words feedback and feed feed forward in the value stream to discover problems for example, in waterfall software projects, we can develop code for an entire year before we get feedback on quality from the testing phase. This is too slow for us to be able to prevent undesirable outcomes. We can use automated build, test and integration processes to immediately detect when a change has been introduced that breaks the code or the deployment process. We can also utilize telemetry in the system so we can see how all components are operating in the production environment so that we can quickly detect when things aren't operating as expected. Telemetry should be radiated to the entire value stream so we can see how our changes affect other portions of the system as a whole. It is important to use feedback loops to create organizational learnings and use that to prevent problems from occurring again. So we need systems and tools and technologies that we can use to see when things break so we can test it. Once we can detect problems, we need to handle them. The goal of swarming is to contain problems before they can spread and to diagnose and treat the problem so it cannot occur again. In doing so, we can build ever deeper knowledge about how to manage our systems, converting inevitable ignorance into knowledge. In the Toyota manufacturing plant, every worker station has an end-on cord hanging above. When something goes wrong, anyone can pull the cord to alert the team leaders and immediately work to resolve the problem. If the problem can't be resolved within a specific time, for example, one minute, the production line is halted so the entire organization can assist with fixing the issue. So instead of working around the problem or scheduling to fix it later, the problem is swarmed to be fixed immediately. To enable fast feedback in the technology stream, we need equivalent of the end on cord and swarming response. This also requires that we create the culture that makes it safe and even encourage to pull the cord when something goes wrong. When an end on cord is triggered, we swarm to resolve the problems and prevent uh, introducing new work until it has been resolved. This provides fast feedback for everyone, especially the person who pulled the cord. Preventing the introduction of new work enables techniques such as continuous integration, continuous deployment with single piece flow in the technology value stream. All changes that pass our continuous build and integration test are deployed into production and any change that causes any test to fail trigger the end on cord and are swarmed until resolved. So we see our manufacturing plant flow as the continuous integration and continuous deployment processes. So when a test fail triggers fail, test triggers fail, then we halt that code change from reaching the next step in the production environment. We should be immediately notified that a test has failed so we can look at it and fix it. Then we fix it and we add it to the continuous integration stream again. We may not need to alert the 
product owner or team leader every time a test fail, but we should be able to see when a test fail. And if we can't fix it, then we could escalate the situation and alert managers and stuff like that. Moving on to the next. The effectiveness of approval processes decrease as we push decision making further away from when the work is performed. Doing so also lower the quality and cycle time of work. This is very common in top-down bureaucratic command and control systems. which become ineffective when the variance between who should do something and who is actually doing something is too large. This is also common. This is also common in the following ineffective quality controls. Requiring other teams to complete manual tasks that can be automated and run as needed by the team who needs the work to be done. Requiring approvals from busy people who are distant from the work process and don't have adequate knowledge. Pushing large batches of work to teams and special committees for approval and process and then waiting for response. Instead, everyone in the value stream should, fix, should find and fix problems in their area of control as part of their daily work. Doing this push quality, safety responsibility and decision making to where the work is performed instead of relying on approval from the distant executives. We should use peer reviews of proposed changes to gain needed assurance that the changes will operate as designed, automate quality checks that is typically performed by quality assurance and infosec, Instead of developers needing to create a request or schedule a test to be run, the test can be performed on demand, enabling developers to quickly test their own code, get feedback if the test fail, and otherwise deploy it. Doing this truly makes quality everyone's responsibility instead of being the sole responsibility of separate departments. It's possible for a developer to learn anything. It's impossible for a developer to learn anything when someone yells at them for something they broke six months ago. That's why we need to provide feedback to everyone as quickly as possible in minutes, not months. So that is a lot of DevOps, just how we can get change, how we work at workplaces so that we always can get feedback and quickly to be able to truly create something good. We can't use waterfall process where we create code and then we wait six months for someone else to say this didn't work. We need to move things around so the person that creates code can make sure themselves that it works as it should be. And when they know that, they should have responsibility to say that this works as it should and let's move it to production. Then we are at the third and last way. This focus on creating a culture of continual learning and experimentation. These principles enable constant individual learning, which is then turned to team and organizational learning. And for this, we need high trust culture. At workplaces where workers have little ability to integrate improvements and lear learning into their daily work or suggest improvements, there tend to be a culture of fear and low trust. Where workers who make mistakes are punished and those who make suggestions or point out problems are viewed as whistleblowers or troublemakers. When this occurs, leadership is actively suppressing and punishing learning and improvement. In the technology value stream, our goal is to create a high trust culture, reinforcing that we are lifelong learners who must take risk in our daily work. We learn from our success and failures, identifying ideas that don't work and reinforce those that do. We deserve time for improvement of daily work and to further accelerate and ensure learning. So let's talk more about culture of fear and why we don't want it. When catastrophic outcomes arise, our, problem, our or problems happen in our complex systems. We don't want management to respond with name blaming, shaming a person who caused the problems or it's worth punishing them. Instead, creating a culture of trust which makes it unlikely that problems, if we have a 
This creates a culture of fear, which makes it unlikely that problems and failure signals are ever reported in the future, leading to even more failures in the future. Dr. Ron Westrom observed the importance of organizational culture on safety and performance in healthcare organizations. He discovered that the presence of generative culture was one of the top predictions for patient safety. He defined three cultures, pathological, bureaucratic, and generative. On the left, we can see the pathological. Organizations are characterized by large amount of fear and threat. People hoard information for political reasons or distort it to make themselves look better. And failure is often hidden. In the middle, we have the bureaucratic, where organizations are characterized by rules and processes, often to help individual departments to maintain their turf. Failure is processed through a system of judgment, resulting in either punishment or of justice and mercy. Generative organizations, the right one, are characterized by actively seeking and sharing information to better enable the organization to achieve its mission. Responsibilities are shared throughout the value stream and failures result in a reflection and genuine inquiry. So Dr. Westrod could see that hospitals where they wanted to learn when something went wrong were better at saving patients and we can take that to our technology value stream to see as if we want to learn our learn when something goes wrong, it should make us better at creating safer systems. Just as Dr. Weston found in healthcare, a high trust generative culture is also predicted, also predicted IT organizational performance in technology value streams. We want to establish the foundation of a generative culture by striving to create safe systems of work when accidents and failures occur. Instead of looking for human errors, we look for ways to prevent them from happening again. We can conduct the blameless postmortem after every incident to gain the best understanding of how the accident occurred and agree upon what the best countermeasure is to prove, improve the system. By doing this, we create organizational learning. By removing blame, you remove fear. By removing fear, you enable honesty, and honesty enables prevention. It's a very common concept nowadays in DevOps is the blameless post-mortem. So every time you get a failure, usually in production, something goes wrong, then you pause all work, you gather all the people who were involved in the change of what caused the accident. And then you sit down and everyone gives their point of view of what happened and what caused the change. And this is not to give blame or accuse anyone one of you did this. This is done to learn. So after this is done, they should write down a report that explains what caused this and how can we prevent this from happening again. And then they usually involve some new types of tests or any other checks or changing something of how they work, then they should implement this in their daily work. So blameless postmortems is very big in DevOps. Mike Rofer observed in the Toyota Kata that in the absence of improvement, processes don't stay the same due to chaos and entropy, processes actually degrade over time. In the technology value stream, when we avoid fixing our problems, relying on daily workaround, our problems and technical depth accumulate until all we are doing is performing workarounds, trying to avoid disaster. This is why daily improvement of work is more important than daily work. We do this by reverse reserving time to pay down technical debt, fix defects, refactoring and improve problematic areas of our code and environment. We can reserve cycles in each development interval for kites and blitzen, where engineers self-organize into teams to work on fixing any problems they want. The result of this is that everyone finds and fixes problems in their areas of control all the time as part of their daily work. So I think this is also something many corporations can get better at, to have more time 
in planning for improvement and not just writing code to create new features. We also need to maintain what we have, which I think many corporations lack. But then if you're short-sighted, you see this as, but then we can't create as much, much feature and functionality for our customers. And then we say, if we compete against another corporation, they say, we can do this uh, program in one year. Then we have to say, it will take us a year and a half instead. So why should they pick us? And I think that's a short-sighted, short way of looking at it. With the long way instead, we can see that if we take this one and a half year, we'll get it. Then we can create better value stream, so we call it where in the end it will allow us to have shorter development time than other people needed, more or less. They also do DevOps, but then they should also have more time for improvement. We want to have mechanisms that make it possible for new learnings and improvements discovered locally to be captured and shared globally for the entire organization. When teams or individuals have experiences that create expertise, our goal is to convert that knowledge into explicit codified knowledge. When someone performs similar work, they should do so with the cumulative and collective experience from everyone in the organization who's done the same work. One way to do this is to use chat rooms and chatbots to automate and capture knowledge, create transparency and documentation of work. Chat logs are inherently recorded and make all communication public and searchable. And by using bots in the chat to activate automated processes, it can be searchable how things are done. New hires can look through chat logs to see how things are done. People are also more apt to asking questions when they see other people doing it. And the bots can also be used for getting health checks from systems and posting status updates on commits and tests and how they're doing. So we want to create a transparent environment where everyone can take part in how things work to expand our knowledge. Another way to spread knowledge is to encode, encode it and create a single shared source of repo, source code repository for the entire organization. When anything in the source code is updated, it automatically propagates to every other service that is used that use that library and is integrated throughout the each deployment pipeline. Example of things to put in the repository can be configuration standards, deployment tools, testing standards and tools, monitoring and analysis tools and tutorials. This further expands upon the configuration management and infrastructure as code, which is also something that's big in DevOps. So we want all knowledge should be in code, basically. We have a production environment, runs servers, servers need to be configured, need configs, we have to install programs. And then we have a problem if that is done by people. People get fired, people get angry. Uh, we need to communicate with people and we lose knowledge we can do. So a way to uh, remedy this is to have everything in code. So our production environment shouldn't be set up man with manual steps. It should be done via code, via tools like Ansible, Chef. We should have uh, code for uh, starting the entire uh, virtualization software with infrastructure as code with like, uh, forgot what it's called, trans something. Yeah. Um, question, please provide some real time tools that are helpful to maintaining these chat logs. Uh, I don't know any real time tools. It usually depends on what kind of chat program you use. Um, I think many corporations develop their own, uh, but this should just be a quick Google away to find chatbots to do all amazing kind of things. So 
So we want knowledge to be in code. So anyone can just run that code and they will have the exact same production like environment like someone else. It shouldn't be, oh, you, I think you need to install this program and I think you need this kind of um, configuration and then something changes and then that person hasn't been made aware of that change. So then they can set up the environment and then no one else can. I worked for uh, a company a while ago uh, where we had that problem. So I came in, I was going to do tests. I was going to rewrite the test from Java 7 to Java 0.8 or something. So then I needed to set up the entire test environment so I could run the tests, but no one in the entire company knew how to set up the test environment. So I spent two months trying to get a single test to run. We emailed people, talked to people, and no one could help us do it. We were three people who were going to do that. So we spent three mo two months trying to get the test to run. And we couldn't even do that, so we couldn't update the test code. So this is why we want setup to be done via code instead. So when we change what programs are needed or something, something configuration for our production environment, that change should be done in the code and not manually by hand in the environment. Instead, we change the code and then we recreate the entire production environment so it's concurrent with the code we have. And then this, um, this extends to all kinds of knowledge then. So people can search it, anyone can find it. It shouldn't be encomposed to just one or some departments. All knowledge we have should be available to everyone in our organization. So let's talk about leaders, our boss. Traditionally, leaders are expected to be responsible for setting objectives, allocating resources for achieving those objectives and establishing the right combination of incentives. Leaders lead by making all the right decisions. However, there is significant evidence that shows greatness is not achieved by leaders making the right decision. Instead, the leader's role is to create the conditions so their team can discover greatness in their daily work. To create greatness require both leaders and workers, each of whom is mutually dependent upon each other. According to Jim Womack, author of something called Gemba Walks, leaders are not close enough to the work which is required to solve any problem, and the frontline workers do not have a broad organizational context or the authority to make changes outside their own area of work. Leaders must elevate the value of learning and problem solving. Mike Rofer formalized this in the coaching kata, the guy who wrote the improvement kata. The result is to mirror the scientific method where we explicitly state our true north goal, such as sustain zero accidents or double throughput within a year. These, strategies, these strategic goals then inform the creation of iterative short-term goals, which are cascaded, through the, cascaded and executed by establishing target conditions at the value stream and work center level. For example, reduce lead time by 10% within the next two weeks. These target conditions frame the scientific experiment. We explicitly state the problems we are seeking to solve, our hypothesis of how we our proposed countermeasures will solve it, our method for testing that hypothesis, our interpretation of our results, and our use of learnings to inform the next iteration. The leaders helps coach the person conducting the experiment with questions that may include what was your last step, what happened, what did you learn, what obstacles were you working on, what is your expected outcome and what can we check to see how you're doing? This problem solving approach is which leaders help workers see and solve problems in their daily work as a core of the Toyota production system of learning organizations, the improvement kata, high reliability organizations, aka what we want in DevOps. You get the comment in the chat, manually doing forensics on old systems to try and decipher what the ancient seeds of did when setting up their system is a nightmare. Exactly. So we want to move away from manual work 
and make sure that everything is done via the code because everyone should be able to read the code and understand what is done and they can change that code and then it will should propagate to the environment. So nothing is hidden and we don't have one expert that knows everything. So every time we should, we're going to set up the production environment, we have to go talk to that one guy because he's the only one who has the knowledge. He doesn't want to share and or no one has the time to learn because everyone is busy doing something else. And then that, that guy quits and then you have no one who knows how to run the environment. So as they used to say, code is king to some extent at least. This is the three ways of DevOps. Uh, I also wanted to talk about teams and team setup because that's something that many has a connect, made a connection to between DevOps. So the old way of looking at it is the left one where we have the silos, as many people see it, where we see it because you have developers, we have IT operations and we have quality assurance. They are three separate, separate departments. They want different things and we just throw work over walls between each other and then we leave it up to them to fix it. And then the right one, we have the DevOps way of looking at teams. Where we have cross-functional teams. So instead we have one team which contains IT operations, quality assurance and development people. So the entire team can create the functionality, test the functionality and deploy the functionality. The team should be able to do everything that's needed. It shouldn't be passed off to another team to do the next part and from them passed on to another part, so to speak. And DevOps ways of looking at teams takes a lot from something called Conway's law. It states that organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs with the copies of the communication structure of these organizations. The larger an organization is, the less flexi flexibility it has and the more pronounced the phenomenon. So Conway's law was about, he made an experiment where, where he created three groups with different group setup. So we had one group with four people, one with three, one with two, and one with one group, something like that. And each group was supposed to create a compiler. And then it looks at the result. And then what they saw was that the group which were four people created a four phase compiler. The three person group created a three, three pass compiler, two created a two pass compiler, and the one created a one pass compiler. So <laughs> the system mirrors our structure of how we work. Then Eric S. Raymond conceived a simplified form from um, Conway's law, which says the organization of the software and the, and the organization of the software team will be congruent, commonly stated as if you have a four groups of working on a compiler, you get the four pass compiler. So having multiple compilation units, people in the value stream, in this case four, increase the number of steps, source code must, code must pass before it reaches its completion. So if you go back to the previous picture we have had before, you see the old setup where we had the one department, they do one part, and then we move it to the next, they do one part, move it to the next, and they do one part. So that we have a, a three piece system which will impact our code and how it works. If we instead had a cross functional teams where each team can do everything, it, we will create the one pass compiler, so to speak, instead of the four pass compiler. And if we follow uh, Conway's law improperly, it will negatively impact an organization production outcomes and prevent agility. If we instead execute it properly, developers are empowered, empowered to develop, test and deploy with independence, generating significant value to the customer. To embody DevOps best practice, we must organize our teams with certain insights in mind. This strategy should include making the most advantage of Conway's law. And then we get into organizational archetypes. Businesses uh, fall into three organizational structures. 
We have the functional, which is, comp which is companies who optimize for skill, labor division, and cost reduction. This has been the prevailing method for of organizations for operations. So IT, QA, InfoSec. It's all about being good at your specific task and costing as little as possible. Then we have market archetype. This is how many prominent organizations adopting DevOps operate. In extreme examples, such as Amazon or Netflix, each service team is simultaneously responsible for feature delivery and service support. Here we optimize for um, for market value, we want to be fast. Then we have the matrix, the combination of the both functional and market. Organizations who attempt to combine both of the above orientation often resulting in complicated organizational structures, such as individual individuals having to report to two managers or more, and sometimes achieving neither of those goals of functionality or market orientation. So we shouldn't overdo it. Problems that are caused by overly function oriented is when traditional IT teams tend to split up and organize themselves into according to speciality. So we have the IT operations, QA, development, each team, because that's what they are good at, they focus on that part. This has the compounding effect on the value stream by vastly reducing workflow and exasperating long lead times. Other problems may be poor hand of coordination and increased amount of rework low quality results and bottlenecks are more widespread. Compounding the issue of the person performing the work often has little visibility or understanding of how their work relate to any value stream goals. For example, I'm just configuring servers because someone told me to. This places workers in a creativity and motivates vacuum. Instead, we want to enable the market oriented teams optimizing for speed. DevOps uh, largely advocate for optimizing for speed over optimizing for cost. This is to improve the ability for small teams to deliver on customer value quickly. The extreme version of this is uh, cross-functional teams that work independently. And these true DevOps teams are able to design, uh, design and run user experiments, build and deliver new features, deploy it and run it in server production with themselves and fix any defects without manual dependencies on other teams, thus enabling them to move faster. So one team can do everything from development until it's in production. Uh, this has been adopted by Netflix and Amazon, and uh, Amazon says it's one of the primary reasons why they are able to move so fast and grow at the same time. So even though Yes, recommended market-oriented teams. It's worth pointing out that it is possible to create effective high-velocity organizations with functional orientation. Cross-functional and market-oriented teams are one way to achieve fast flow and reliability, but it's not the only path. In the right high-trust culture, organizations can achieve high-velocity effective workflow by enabling automated self-service platforms and promoting full transparency in work prioritization. For example, High performance with a functional oriented, functional oriented and centralized operation group is possible as long as service teams get what they need from operations reliably and quickly, ideally on demand and vice versa. Many of the most admired DevOps organizations retain functional orientation of operations, including Etsy, Google and GitHub. So in the picture on the left side, we have the functional oriented and on the right we have uh, speed. So we have our each team, we have the server, server team, network team, database team, VM team. And when the feature team, the developers are done with something, they send it to the next one, they send it to the next one, and they send it to the next one and so forth. And then when something goes wrong, it's passed back and forth. So it can work if people are good at communicating and being transparent, but it's harder to make it work. It's easier when we have cross-functional teams, or at least if we have a function operation, we make sure we have a platform as a service. So the operations teams, they their work is to create uh, services, 
tools that the developers can use to take their code into the production system. They can still write tests. They don't have to code, but they should work on the systems that the developers use. High-performing DevOps teams have one shared trait. The whole team shares a common goal. The goal of making quality, availability, and security a part of everyone's job every day. John Jody Malki, he's a CTO at Ticketmaster, highlighted this in his theory about DevOps American football metaphor. Operations are the offensive linemen. The devs are the skill positions like quarterback and wide receiver whose job it is to move the ball down the field. The jobs of operations is to help make sure that the dev has enough time to properly execute their place. So everyone should work together to as quickly as possible take changes and add it into production. Over specialization and extreme consequence of functional orient orientation can cause silosation. When team members are isolated in their contributions to the value stream and have no alignment with others. We rely upon an ever increasing number of technologies. We must have engineers to have specialized and achieve mastery in the technology areas we need. However, we don't want to create a specialist who are frozen in time, only understanding and able to contrib contribute to that one area of the value stream. To counter this, encourage people to become generalist by providing varied varied opportunities for skill development, encourage a growth mindset in organization and hire for generalist skills. By cross-training and growing engineering skills, generalists can do orders of magnitude more work than their specialist counterparts. And it's also improve our overall flow of work by removing queues and wait time. So we want to encourage that, for example, for one day a month, one developer sits down with the operations guy and looks at what they are doing, try to learn what, how they work and what they do for so, and so forth. And the other way around, try to mix people up to have them learn from each other. So in the picture here, we have different types of people. We want to avoid the eye-shaped specialist. They only know one thing. They have few skills, but are very good at them. It creates bottlenecks. Instead, we want the T-shaped, where they expertise in one area, but they have many skills in many areas. And the true common goal is to have the E-shaped, but that's one of course harder to achieve and can be expensive, is with the deep expertise in a few areas and expertise in many areas. And they're always innovating. What we don't want is rock stars for example one guy who is best at something and then everyone just sends all of their all of that work to that guy so he only does that thing because then we get problems partly if something needs to be done there or something goes wrong we overly dependent on that person for example the production environment goes wrong because something went wrong in that person's code Okay, then we have to wake that guy up and get him back to the office to fix his problem, but he's asleep in the middle of the night. <laughs> so we want to be able to share knowledge so everyone knows a little bit about many things so many people can fix it. Making development work more visible to operations and vice versa is the key to establishing the DevOps culture and managing different teams. There are three broad strategies we can, which can accomplish this. Empower developers to become more productive by creating self-service proficiencies. Integrate ops engineers into your service teams to encourage collaboration, including ops engineers with all daily dev work from inception to production conclusion. And to achieve these strategies, we can do the following. And here, remember, operations is not only IT, but it's all the other ones, quality assurance, info second, databases, and so forth. So, create shared services to increase developer productivity. 
get operations to build platforms and service, services which will boost development efficiency, encouraging the creation of DevOps tools optimized for internal customers, the development teams. Reduce operations becoming a bottleneck in the value stream and enables the realization of market-oriented goals. So they should create tools and platforms which developers use when they take their code to production. So continuous integration, continuous deployment, uh, pipelines and tools and so forth. Embed operations engineers into our service teams. Integrate operations into development teams early on is fun fundamental to fostering close interaction on production responsibilities. On top of that, merging the two connects operations to service delivery and support and promotes cross skills training. Assign an ops operator liaison to each service team. If it is not possible to embed an engineer within a service team, uh, for example, then the cross functional teams, we still have the functional one, then we should delegate an operations liaison to coordinate with team directly. This will motivate developers and operations to collaborate better on all project stages. Integrate operations into development rituals. With operations engineers or liaisons working closely with dev teams, it's important to ensure that they get involved with all existing development culture and practices. This way, operations can better plan and influence work early on pre-production. Invite our operations into a development stand-ups one of these rituals is the Scrum Daily Stand-Up, where everyone shares what work was completed yesterday and what will be do done today, what is preventing them from moving forward. With operations present to listen to devs describe this, they can glean valuable information which may affect their own activities. Invite operations to our development perspectives. Just as crucial as the daily stand-up is ensuring that operations attend retrospect retrospectives at each of the development intervals. The Agile practice encourages a review of past tasks, promotes feedback and improvement for future work, and prompts organizational learnings within teams. Make relevant ops work visible on shared Kanban boards, as established in the three ways principles, the visualization of work between dev and ops is an integral component for improving workflow. This does not simply mean that devs share their work, it is vital to highlight relevant operation activities as well. Kanban boards are an excellent team management tool for achieving this. Implementing this strategy can help prevent operation crisis in production and reduce blockages on product delivery. And that was the end. So this is the more theoretical view of DevOps. Now, of course, there is a lot to be learned about what tools exist, how we can use those tools, other um, management techniques techniques to use to create the whole learning environment, stuff like that. So this is just scraping the top, but gives a broad overview of what DevOps aim to achieve and how we can achieve it at some point. So the quote, a manifestation of creating dynamic learning organizations that continually reinforce high trust culture norms should make a little more sense, but I hope you also have some more questions on what DevOps actually is. But one of the big takes, takeaways that I want people to have from this is that DevOps is not tools, it's how we use the tools to create a good work environment, work culture, basically. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, in our organization, we have monthly releases to production, perhaps involving ops in devs on a daily basis can create waste. On a daily basis, our team manages Build, deploy, and test independent of operation. What's your opinion? Okay, let's read that once again. Mm -hmm. In our organization, we have a bumper release to production, perhaps involving operations in devs on a daily basis can create waste. What do you mean when you say create the waste if we involve, if we have them interact with each other? 
on a daily basis, our team manages build, deploy, and test independent operations. Wasteful operations. Mm. Okay, so sure, maybe they don't. If if they have to spend time with the developers, sure they won't have as much time working on their tasks. But the point is that they should learn from each other and be able to create an environment where the operations can create their own tools, which the developers can use. So it's about creating learning and communication and trust between the develop the departments. We want to bridge, bridge the two departments, not keep them separate. And if you already do, I'm guessing when you say our teams, I guess you mean developer teams, but they manage build, deploy and test. So that's already a good start if you are able, the developers themselves are able to uh, test their code and deploy it on production, I'm guessing you mean. And for so then it feels like you already have a pipeline from um, your okay, developers create something, they are done, so I want to move it to production. Then it feels like, okay, so deploy is not on production. Yeah, but you deploy it on something. So then you should already have some kind of pipeline that takes your code and moves it to production. Okay, some test environments, yeah. So then we want to move developers closer to operations so they can work out the system which allows the developers themselves to take their code and add it to production system, basically. And that's easier to do if we have good communication and trust between the developers and operations, and then they also learn what they need from each other to be able to do that. So what do the developers want from the operations to be able to take their code to productions? And what does operations need from the developers for them to be able to create such a system or want to create such a system, basically? Any other questions? If someone's writing a question, I can make it insert. So many people at least used to when they spoke of DevOps, they say like, oh, only DevOps only works for um, small startups and websites and stuff like that. Uh, but that's not true because many, many big corporations like Google and there are quite a lot of government corporations in the United States, for example, that also use DevOps. Uh, but DevOps doesn't has to mean, have to mean like, oh, the show code should be added to production. That's just one of the one of the many end goals of how we want it to work for many people. But we don't have to include all the steps at one corporation for saying this is DevOps. Since DevOps is so, it can be hard to define. It's up to, to corporations themselves to find out what they want from DevOps. But most corporations should want the high trust culture norms where things can go wrong and we learn from it. We want people to work together but if then that means that we want them to be able to add code to production directly, maybe that doesn't have to be the end goal. We don't take that part of the DevOps way of working. Yeah, so two good books is the DevOps handbook and effective DevOps. You should be able to read them online for free. Um, we have something called BTH summons, 
So it's basically an online library where you can search books. And I know that both these books are available on the BTH Summon page. You can get them from there if you want to read them. And then we also have the The Phoenix project, it's also one of the classic starter books when it comes to DevOps. So this one is more of a, what's it called? Oh, literature book, it's not facts and information. So it's take the, um, it's the settings of a corporation that is not working DevOps. So the setup is they have a corporation and things are not going well things are going very poorly and they can't deliver to the customers. And then there is one guy who gets, becomes boss of an operations stuff. And then he part by part manages to move the corporation to work according to DevOps. And this is then before DevOps is a thing. So he just tries to discover how he can change how the corporation works and moves it towards something that eventually is DevOps. So it's more if you want to get a picture of how it can look for a corporation to move from something into DevOps and what it means for them. And these two books are more, okay, this is DevOps. We use these tools. Uh, we want the high trust cultural norms. Yeah. So I think these two are a very good, very good start. And once you have read those, you can take on the effective DevOps book because it has a little bit different approach. Okay. Many concepts are understandable in a web development context, but a bit harder to understand in other contexts. For example, embedded systems are the end of situations when it's not relevant. Yeah, so that's what I was aiming for just now about the big corporations and stuff like that. So yeah, an embedded system, uh, I've never worked in them, but I guess you don't have a direct line to their production environment, so to speak. You don't, um, you don't have access to the machine that is running your embedded code. It doesn't have Wi-Fi on it, so to speak, so you can't update it. So then that's not really your production environment. So then maybe we should take a step back. So instead of having a goal to put, push your code to production, it's instead to be able to push your code to the, um, to the build phase. So you should be able, when you have developed your code, it should automatically be made into an build, a build that can be shipped to your embedded machines that run the code. So that's a bit about, you have to figure out what, how does your corporation work? What are your end goals? And how can we involve DevOps in that? So even if you don't have the servers running 24 seven with web pages up and running, that's not, that's not the end goal of DevOps, is to create the high trust cultural norms where we trust each other, people are able to do their work. We continue to always learn uh, from our mistakes and stuff like that. I hope that gave somewhat of an answer. So tools is not the point of DevOps. That's just something we use to create a good work culture and environment. And that work culture and environment can work everywhere, no matter what kind of company you have. It doesn't really matter if the code should run on a website or a TV screen somewhere. It's that we have the tools available to do what we should and test our things, get constant feedback when we do something. We shouldn't have to wait the six months until our code is tested. We should be able to do that iteratively when we create it, we test it, and then when something goes wrong, we should learn from it, and then we just do that over and over again. 